God doesn't want us to see our relationship with him as one of just a bunch of rules and regulations. Uh, in fact, when, when some of the people came to Jesus and said, you know, out of all the commandments in the Old Testament, uh, what are the ones that you would say are the most important? Uh, I, I've been told there are 613 laws in the Old Testament. They said, Jesus, if you had to, if you had to break it down, what would be the most important? And what did he say? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you know, we, we've been here this morning, and we've been celebrating our love for the Lord and, and celebrating the fact that we, we do that because he loved us first. But let me remind you about that other part, that we are to love others, to love our neighbor as ourself. Look, listen to what James said in James two fourteen to 17. He said, what good is it, my brothers? If someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and well fed, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. I bring all of that up to remind us that it's, it's great for us to gather and worship and to sing praises to the Lord and to express our love for Him. But He reminds us that a big part of our love for Him is to love the people around us, to, to make sure that we're doing what we can to take care of their needs. And as we, uh, as we take this act of worship by bringing our tithes and offerings to Him, one of the reasons that we do that is so we can help meet the needs of those around us. Uh, about $12,500 of our of our budget goes into help meeting the needs of people in our community. That doesn't say anything about the love offerings that we often take, the uh, donations that, that many times we receive for other ministries, like we are uh, receiving snacks right now for the Collins Children's Home. But what you put in the plate right now uh, gives us an opportunity to continue to meet the physical needs of those around us and thus express our love for them and our love for the Lord. Uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that part of our worship to you is our ability to help people in need. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to, to meet the physical needs of people in our church family through our benevolence ministry, uh, and then also in our community uh, as we uh, extend that benevolence ministry and as we uh, partner with our uh, local area ministry partners and and send food to people that are in need, and cook meals, and provide housing. Uh, Father, thank you for that practical application of our love for you. Uh, Father, I pray that you would receive these tithes and offerings that we bring to you, uh, that you would use them to help us as we meet those needs, and that you would also use them to take the gospel to the places where it's most desperately needed. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning, Utica. Uh, this morning we continue our look in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, what an incredible chapter this is. Uh, so much encouragement, uh, so many opportunities for us to grow in our relationship with the Lord. Let me just uh, take you back. Uh, in, in order to really get a running start, uh, pun intended for, for what, we're, what we're looking at, but in order to get a running start on today's passage, I feel like uh, we need to go back and take a look at how we have gotten to where we are now. If you look back to verse 1 in Hebrews chapter 12, it says, uh, Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we were reminded of the fact that the Bible uses the Christian race uh, and, and uses the imagery of, of a marathon, that we are to continue running this race that God has set before us, and he gives us instructions on how we are to do that. And then as we got into the middle part of the chapter last week, we talked about discipline. We talked about the fact that this, this race that we're running is not always an easy race, and sometimes God allows difficult things to come into our life, and sometimes God brings difficult things into our life, and he does that because he loves us, because he wants us to run that race well. In verse 7, it says, it is for discipline that you have to endure, for God is treating you as sons. And we, we were reminded of the fact that it is, it is human nature for us in times of difficulty and hardship it's human nature for us to think that either God is apathetic, that he, doesn't, he just doesn't care about what's going on in our life, or maybe he is just not able to, to set before us the kind of path that we would like to be running. But we were reminded last week that many times he specifically brings those difficult things into our life because he's trying to, to train us and to shape us. And verse 11 uh, says that, uh, for the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. That word trained is uh, from the word that we get our word gymnasium from. It just is a reminder that many times life is like going to the gym. Uh, some of you probably like going to the gym. Uh, I'm not usually one of those people. I don't, I don't like that experience, but I know it's important. And I know that we need to get into the gym of life and we have to keep going forward. And so the question this morning as we continue that same thought is, how do we keep moving forward in the face of adversity? Knowing that things are often very, very difficult, knowing that we can get very, very easily discouraged in our life. How do we keep moving forward in the face of adversity? And that's where we'll pick up this morning. And we'll be looking at Hebrews chapter 12, verses 12 to 17. Uh, hopefully you've had enough time to find this passage in your Bible. And I would ask you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's word. You follow along in your copy as I read from mine, as normal, I am reading today from the English Standard Version. Uh, that's the words that you'll see on your screen today. But I would highly encourage you to have your Bible open, be taking notes, uh, especially today because there are many Old Testament references in our passage today. And you'll want to jot those down uh, in, in your Bible so you can study them later. But listen to what the pastor says to his discouraged congregation. He says, therefore... Lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. That no one is sexually immoral or unholy, like Esau who sold his birthright for a single meal. For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no chance to repent, though he sought it with tears." This is God's word for us today. So let's ask him to use it 
to encourage us that we might know how to move forward in the face of adversity. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your word. We're thankful that, as your word says, it is a, a light unto our path. Uh, Lord, that it, it helps to renew our strength as we place our hope in you, that we might run and not grow weary, that we, that we might walk and not faint. Lord, my guess is there are more than a few people here today that might feel weary in their running. They might be at the point of fainting, even, even trying to maintain a walk moving forward. So, Father, I pray that you might use the power of your word this morning, that you might use the teaching of your Holy Spirit and the conviction that comes from that, that you might help us to keep moving forward. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. So how do we, how do we keep moving forward in the face of adversity? I believe this passage uh, gives us an, inc an incredible amount of wisdom in how to do that. And it's amazing sometimes how, how simple it can sound. Uh, for those of you who were here last week, you, hopefully you still have your worship guide somewhere tucked away because that's going to be a keeper. Uh, that's probably the, the longest preaching points I've ever had in all of my ministry. Uh, those, those four different points that we had on last week's worship guide were, were incredibly long. They were complex but I hope they were encouraging, and you'll notice today we have just the opposite. Uh, the, the main points here are two words each. Uh, I, I think sometimes what can be very simple can still be very hard. But we're going to look to see how we can keep moving forward in the face of adversity. Look, at, look back at verse 12 to begin with. Uh, the pastor says, Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And so right off the bat, he uses... This imagery of drooping hands and weak knees, which is symbolic of someone who is discouraged. Uh, if you think about a runner who's running that marathon, you know, they, they start with the great strides, and by the end of the race, their, their hands are drooping, they're not holding their hands up quite as high, their knees are, are weak, and so it is the picture of despondency. Uh, and, and sometimes it is the picture of fear, that someone is fearful of, of not being able to keep moving forward. And it's a, it's a great picture for us. And as I said, there, there's a lot in this passage that comes from the Old Testament. And we get that right off the bat here in, uh, in, in verse 12 because this picture comes from Isaiah chapter 35, most likely. Uh, the, the, the imagery, the wording is very, very similar to what we read in Isaiah 35. I would encourage you, I don't feel like we have time this morning to read uh, all of these passages and all of their entirety, but I would encourage you to, to read the entire chapter of Isaiah 35 because, because God is speaking to the Israelites when they are in captivity and they are in Babylon and they are discouraged. They wonder, are we ever going to get back home? Does God, does he even know where we are? Has he forgotten about us? And so many of them are feeling despondent and God sends this prophetic word through the prophet Isaiah to encourage them, to help them have a vision for the future of what's going to happen when the ransomed of the Lord return to Israel. And he paints this, this beautiful picture for them, and we read a, a little bit about that. And from that, in Isaiah 35, verses 3 and 4, where he says, Strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, Say this, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. And so the pastor here takes this imagery from the Old Testament. And he says, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. And so the first thing that I think we have to do as we try to keep moving forward in the face of adversity is we have to buck up. And yes, that's theological terms that I learned in seminary. We have to buck up. We, we got to make sure that we are not despondent and discouraged. Uh, I, I looked that one up just to make sure I was on the right track. And here's what we read about that phrase from uh, Merriam-Webster 
Com. It defines that phrase as to become encouraged, to, to brace up. And that's what we have to do if we want to keep moving forward in the face of adversity. We have to buck up. We have to make a decision that we're going to keep moving forward. Uh, the, the, the things that we cannot do, we cannot give up. And I would also say to us that we can't just cheer up. It takes more than that. You know, I, I find those as maybe being opposite end, opposite extremes of the same problem. Sometimes you just get so despondent and so discouraged and so weak need that you feel like you just have to give up and you just got to drop out of the race. But at other times, you're, you're fighting that mental battle and you're, you know you're despondent you know you're discouraged. You know that life is weighing you down. And so you're, you're able to cheer yourself up. But church, that is not enough. You can't just cheer yourself up because if you just cheer yourself up but don't work yourself up and actually start doing something, then eventually that cheer is going to return to gloom. So here what the pastor is saying is you have to lift your, your drooping hands. You have to strengthen your weak knees. You have to buck up. You can't allow the circumstances of life to get you down. That's, that's one of the things that we have to do if we're going to keep moving forward in the face of adversity. But then look at verse 13 for a second thing. He says, And make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. Uh, you know, I mentioned lots of Old Testament imagery. Once again, this, this idea of making straight paths from your feet comes right out of the Old Testament. It comes from Proverbs chapter 4. Now, with this, this chapter in particular, I do think that it, that it would be worth our while just to take a look at that context for just a moment. As I read through a portion of this chapter, I see uh, so much similarity with where we are in our church family. We're going through the grow stuff, and so we're allowing Ephesians chapter 5 to kind of speak into our lives. Uh, we've, we've been kind of marinating here in Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, and, and last week, we were talking about discipline uh, as it relates to our sonship, that God loves us as our earthly, our, our heavenly Father, and so he disciplines us. And, and so listen to what we get from the context of Proverbs Chapter 4, uh, look first at verse 20 where he says, My son, be attentive to my words, incline your ear to my saying. So, so this is a father speaking to his son. And so church, just remember that, that in the most difficult times of life, God is still your father. And he is still trying to challenge you to keep moving forward. And so we have here some fatherly advice. Skip down to verse 23 where he begins to give us the specifics of that advice. He says, keep your heart with all vig vigilance, uh, for from it flow the springs of life. Some translations say, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Verse 24, put away from you crooked speech and put devious talk far from you. If you've, if you've been with us on our grow nights, you know that there has been an incredible emphasis in Ephesians chapter 4 and again in Ephesians 5 about our words. It is unbelievable how important our words are. And, and, and the, the writer here, the, the writer of Proverbs is saying, as you keep moving forward, as you guard your heart, you're going to have to be careful with your speech because we don't, we don't even recognize sometimes how damaging our speech can be. We, we might say words that are flippant to us, maybe even humorous to us, but the person who is receiving those words does, is, is not amused by them. They're hurt by them. They're injured by them. And so he says, put away from you crooked speech and let devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. And then here's the verse where the writer of Hebrews grabs this imagery, he says, ponder the path of your feet. Or some translations say, level the path of your feet. Or make straight the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. 
Turn your foot away from evil. If we're going to keep moving forward in the face of adversity, not only do we have to buck up, but we have to straighten up. We have to be mindful of this path that we're on. And it's interesting how the Bible lays this issue out, helping us to understand that part of this is God's job, and part of it is our job. If you think about Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, uh, a passage that I love to quote because it's so true, it's so, it is so valuable in our life, it's so easy to apply sometimes in, in terms of knowing what to do, not always so easy to actually do it, but Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your paths straight. So that is, that's a reminder that if we will trust in the Lord, if we will lean on Him and not on our own understanding, that He will make our paths straight. But we have this very same wording, except now it is our responsibility. The, the writer of Hebrews here, the writer of Proverbs here, says that, that part of that is our job. We have to make sure that we're on the right path and that we're working on the right path. So as we look to straighten up, we recognize that we have to formulate and follow the right path. There is work that we have to do to make sure that we're on the right path. Now, remember the imagery here. The, the, the writer here is talking about the Christian life as if it is this marathon. And he's talking to a runner who is exhausted. He's talking to a runner who is discouraged. He might even be talking to a runner who is injured. And he says, if you're going to finish the race, you better make sure that you are straightening your paths. You, are, you better make sure that everything you can do, you are making level your pathway. Think about it. If a runner is discouraged, if a runner is exhausted, certainly if a runner is injured, the last thing he needs to be doing is running on an uneven pathway, on a, on a path that has potholes and bumps and lots of twists and turns. And so part of what the pastor is telling us is, you better straighten your paths or you are in for a lot of trouble. You better make sure that you're walking the path of holiness. You better make sure that you're taking obstacles out of your pathway, making sure that, that everything that you can do is making your pathway smoother. Uh, one of the words that we like to use around here when, when, we, when we talk about discipleship and the Christian life, especially as it relates to parenting, but it's really true even if we're if we're the ones being discipled and we're just discipling ourselves and, and learning from the Lord. But that word is intentional. We have to be intentional in our discipleship. We have to make effort to actually do the kinds of things that we know to do. Uh, one of the ways that we partner with parents in doing that is we, we occasionally send home cards from the Gospel Project material. And the reason we do that is because we know you don't get enough mail. And so we try to fill up your mailbox, right? No, that's not why we do that. We, we do that so that as parents, you can take some intentional time with your children and continue the conversation that they're having here at church. Now, I'll be the first to say, my family still has a lot of growing to do in that area and that using that particular resource. But, but, but parents grandparents and really all of us, let me just remind us, it does not matter. It does not matter how much we know if we won't actually do it. We, we can come to the sanctuary, we can come to our Sunday school classes, we can sit in Bible studies, and we can hear over and over and over the things that we need to do to grow in our Christian life. But if we don't do any of them, it doesn't do us any good. This is what I'm talking about with formulating our path. We actually have to be intentional to take difficult things, hard things, dangerous things, tempting things out of our path and level our path as much as possible. We have to formulate that path 
And then we have to follow that path. We've got to make sure that we're still moving in the right direction, that we're not swerving to the right or to the left. So we have to buck up and we have to straighten up. Our holiness matters. The way we live our life, it truly matters. Now look at verse 14 as we get back to Hebrews chapter 12. This is, this is what I believe is the, the biggest part of this passage. In fact, everything for the rest of this paragraph kind of hinges on verse 14. Paul, or the, 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 the writer here, not Paul, the writer of Hebrews here uh, gives us this, this main imperative, this main command that we are to strive for peace with everyone and for holiness. And then the rest of the passage really tells us how we are to do that. But he says, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So the, the, the way I want to phrase that this morning is that we have to huddle up. We have to make sure that we understand that God has brought us together as a people. And it is such an important part of our Christian life. We cannot run this race by ourselves. We cannot do it effectively. And a huge part of relating to other people is making sure that we huddle up and strive for peace with everyone. We have to pursue peace with perseverance. How many of you recognize it's not easy to maintain peace? I would say this is probably one of the number one struggles that we have in our household is to remember that God has formed us as a team and he has called us to love each other and encourage each other and help each other. And so the writer here, the pastor here is telling us, you have to strive for peace. You have to, as Paul put it, in Romans 12, 18, you have to make every effort as much as it is possible for you to live in peace with everyone. Those, th that wording is strong, and it's strong for a reason. That verb that's translated strive, you might want to mark this down. It's an incredibly strong word. It's the same word that's often used in the New Testament for persecution. That's the kind of strength we're talking about. That's the kind of aggressiveness that we're talking about. And the writer here, the pastor says that we have to pursue peace. We have to strive for peace with perseverance. Now, we, we've been all over that for the last several weeks. We're, we're, we're working through Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 in our grow nights. And, and I hope you remember how those chapters begin where Paul says, I urge you, brothers, as prisoners of the Lord, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you, to which you have been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, church, there's some, there's some really good news in, in that last verse, in my opinion, because it's a reminder that we don't have to create the peace, do we? God is the only one who can give us peace. First of all, because we know that peace must begin with the peace between us and God. We know that because of our sin, we are at enmity with God. We are enemies of God because of our sin, and we deserve to be under the wrath of God. But Jesus came, as Paul said in Ephesians 2, Jesus came and he himself is our peace. Because he took our sin upon himself, he died for our sin, and he opens up to us the possibility of being adopted into the family of God. So, so God, Jesus gives us peace with God, and then as a result of that, he's the one who gives us horizontal peace as well. We know that it starts with that vertical peace, peace between us and the Heavenly Father, but it must continue with that vertical peace of peace with one another. He gives that to us, but he tells us that our job is to maintain it. Our job is to keep it. 
Our job is to make every effort to live in it. We have to pursue peace with perseverance. It is difficult. It is never-ending. It never relents. You, you can't just shift into neutral and expect to live at peace with the people around you. You must be intentional. And you must be selfless. And you must be loving and sacrificial. And the thought that he tacks on here in this same verse is that you must be holy. That's what he says in verse 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Those two, they seem like different concepts and they are, they are different concepts, but they do go together. I love what George Guthrie said when he made the observation that holiness is a, has a profound impact on our relationships with other people. A profound impact. Not just because our sin often hurts people around us, but also because our sin hurts us to the point that we then hurt people around us. I can't tell you the number of times in my life that I have recognized that I'm being a jerk in my household and showing no patience with my children, no genuine love for my wife, and then I realize the reason I'm doing that is because I'm not walking in holiness in that day, in that week. And then my personal sin, my struggle with sin, gets, it gets multiplied in my relationships with other people and the people that I love the most. And so that's why the pastor is telling us here that we have to strive for peace, we have to pursue peace, and we have to do it with holiness. Now, as I was studying these verses, this verse in particular, I can't help but think that the Beatitudes were on the heart of the pastor here. Because look at Matthew chapter 5, and, and we'll look at two Beatitudes in particular, and then I'll mention a third one, by the way, but listen to why I think that this is what was on his heart. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. Now, I know it's a different word, but that is, that's the idea of holiness. If we are walking in holiness, we are pure in heart. And he says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, do you remember that phrase from Hebrews 12? The holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now get this, I love this part. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God, the children of God. Now remember, who is the pastor in Hebrews 12? Who's he talking to? He's talking to those who are the sons of God. He's saying, it's difficult right now because your heavenly father is disciplining you. Your heavenly father, because he loves you as his son, his daughter, because he loves you, he is allowing hard things to come into your life. So it's all about sonship. And what Jesus says is, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I think Jesus is making the point that, that one of the things that we can do that will most remind people of our Heavenly Father is to live at peace with people. Blessed are the peacemakers. I read a book a few years ago that reminded me of the three different options that we have as we are pursuing relationships with other people. Sometimes we are genuine peacemakers. Sometimes we formulate the right path and we follow the right path, and we're intentional in our decision-making, we're, we're holy in our living, and we are doing everything we can to make peace. We are peacemakers. But more often than not, we fall off onto one of two sides of this issue. But one of the ways that we fall off is that instead of being peacemakers, we are peace fakers. That we pretend like something is is okay. We pretend like everything is hunky dory and rosy and you know I'm I'm getting along with everybody but I'm really just faking it. Really down deep in my heart I'm I'm angry with someone. 
They have offended me, and, and it is gnawing at me. We'll get to that in just a few moments as we talk about weeding out the root of bitterness. But sometimes we're just faking it. We just kind of, we act like we can just sweep things under the rug. And, and here's, here's one of the things that I think we are the most guilty of within the church. We are, we are most guilty of telling ourselves, well, I'll just get over that. I'll, I'll just forgive them and I'll get over it. Which, by the way, that is, that is a biblical solution. You, we can do that. The Bible tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. And many times, if we are mature enough, we can just get over it. We can decide, I'm not going to let this particular sin or this particular annoyance to create a lack of peace in this relationship. I'm just going to ignore it. I'm going to allow my love for this person to cover over that. But many times that's just what we tell ourselves. And what we actually do is we sweep it under the rug, we bury it in our hearts, we fake that there is peace when in fact there is no peace. And we're seething on the inside, we're bitter on the inside, and eventually what's on the inside gets to the outside. That's why the writer of Proverbs in Proverbs 4 said, keep your heart with all vigilance. Because you can't keep those things in your heart. Eventually they're going to come out. And so many times we are peace fakers, but sometimes on the opposite extreme we are peace breakers. And we might couch it in terms of, I'm going to set things right. I, I'm going to make sure that I talk to this person and we're going we're to work through things. But our motives aren't right. Our attitude's not right. Our tone is not right. Or worse yet, we go to everybody in the world except for the person who has actually sinned against us or annoyed us or gotten our danders ruffled up a little bit. That's, that's peace breaking. But Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. Now, in, in Hebrews 12, he actually tells us three different ways that we can work at huddling up. Three different ways that we can work at striving for that peace. Look in verse 15 for the first one. See to it, and by the way, that... that that phrase, that verb, see to it, it carries over for the next three phrases. And it's interesting because it's the same word that is translated in other parts of the Bible for the overseer, the one who is overseeing the congregation. And so the, the pastor here, I believe, is telling us there is a corporate aspect to what's going on here. But he's not just talking to a pastor. He's not just writing to a pastor. He's writing to all of God's children and he says that all of us have to see to it that several things are happening, not just in our lives, but in the lives of people around us. The first one, he says, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. That's an interesting idea because we know that we can't do anything, humanly speaking, to, to give God's grace, especially as it relates to salvation, to someone else. So we know he's not talking about salvation here because we can't give God's grace for salvation. That's something that only God can do. He can use us in the process. But I believe what he's talking about here is the idea of this community aspect of God's grace that helps God's people to move forward in the same direction. Let me give you some imagery that I think might be helpful. If, you, if you're a fan of the Olympics like I am, and I like to watch the swimming events, and you'll know that they put, they put the best swimmers in the middle of the pool. And what happens when they're swimming is there is a wake that is created behind them. And everybody else, lane three, two, one, six, seven, eight, all of those people they want to be on the right side of that wake. 
Because if they're on the right side of that wake, if they're ahead of that wake, even if they're behind the lead swimmer, if you can visualize it, it kind of forms a V backwards and away from those lead swimmers. And if the people to their sides can be ahead of that wake, it's almost as if they're being pushed along by that grace of the lead swimmer. Uh, if you watch NASCAR, same, same idea that if you want to win the race, you better be close enough to the front that you can benefit from the draft of the lead drivers, right? That's, that's the idea here, I believe. I believe that what God is saying is, see to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God. Make sure that everything you're doing in your life will help the people around you to, to kind of keep up with that communal aspect of the grace of God. Now, how do we actually do that? Well, I believe the Bible tells us two very specific ways that we can do that. One of, one of my favorite verses, 1 Peter 4.10, says, As each has received a gift, we are to use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. I, I believe it's the same imagery here. I, I believe that, that what Peter is saying is, God is pouring grace into your life, and as you serve people around you with your spiritual gifts, with your time, with your talents, with your availability, in doing that, you are actually administering God's grace in its various forms. And so we know that we can dole out God's grace through our works. It is, it is hugely important that all of us be looking to serve the people around us because in the midst of that service, we are actually doing a small portion of doling out the grace of God to the people who are benefiting from our service. But then, not to harp on the same subject, but I think God is harping on this same subject a lot recently. Look at Ephesians 4.29. Uh, this is a passage that we looked at on our second grow night, I believe. Paul says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. So not only can we dole out God's grace through our works, but we dole out God's grace through our words. The words that we share with other people, the words that we use, either dole out God's grace and they lift people up and they build people up or they rob from God's grace and they tear people down. And as I was looking at Ephesians 4, I was looking at that verse and I was thinking about the emphasis there. And it says in that verse that we, that we share God's grace to those who hear. There are a lot of different ways that he could have said that. Paul, said, Paul could have said, you know, we, we share God's grace when we speak to other people. But I think he specifically mentions to us, to those who hear because I think he wants us to be reminded that sometimes our perspective is not the same as the perspective of the person who is hearing our words. Sometimes words that we would never fathom to be words that tear down, that's how other people receive them. We, we might see them as lighthearted. We might see them as jovial. We, we might see them as just little passing words here or there. But we have to be very careful with how other people receive those words. And so we can dole out God's grace through our works and through our words. And I've already mentioned this one a little bit, but we'll just touch on this again. In verse 15 in the middle, he says, See to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. I think he's reminding us here that our bitterness is not just our bitterness. Our bitterness has a, it has a, a community effect. Uh, this, this particular phrase comes from Deuteronomy chapter 29 and, and verse 18 where, where Moses is writing about someone in the community of faith who has gone rogue, who has turned their back against the Lord, 
And it talks about this root of bitterness that grows up, and by it, many become defiled. And so we have to be very, very careful as God's people that we are continuing to dole out God's grace by weeding out our bitterness. We cannot allow bitterness to continue to grow in our hearts even when we can't necessarily see it. Even when we know it is still way below the surface and may not be harming anyone, the, the imagery of a plant here is intentional because I believe the pastor is telling us it might be on the inside, it might be buried below the surface. You may not have any evidence of it right now, but if you don't weed it out, it's going to grow up and it's going to surface. And when it surfaces, it's going to damage a lot of people. And so as God's people, as we seek to move forward in the face of adversity, we have to dole out God's grace by weeding out our bitterness. And then finally, look at verses 16 and 17. He says, See to it that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. I wish we had a lot more time to talk about this story, but you're probably familiar with it. Jacob and Esau were the twin sons of Isaac. Jacob was the older son, but we know from the scriptures that, that, that Jacob was the son of the blessing, that he was the one that was eventually going to receive the blessing of God. And it was, it was his line that was going to be the, 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 the right line. But we know that it, part of that is the sovereignty of God. Part of it is the sinfulness of man. And we read in the book of Genesis, there comes a time where, where Jacob wants to scheme against Esau to steal his birthright. And so he and his mom cook up this idea of what they're going to do. And, and Esau returns from the field, having been out hunting and pursuing game, and he is famished. He wants some food more than he's ever wanted it before. And what do you know? But Jacob has this delicious bowl of stew waiting for him. And the story goes on to tell us that because of his hunger, because of his appetite, that Esau makes an incredibly foolish decision. If you look at verse 16 there, the emphasis in that verse, one of the words that is fronted for emphasis is where it says he sold his birthright for a single meal. The emphasis is on that word single. And so what is happening here is that, that Esau was not able to deal appropriately with his own physical appetites. And as a result of that, he sold away his birthright. George Guthrie says, The cravings of the moment outweighed the premier gifts of a lifetime. And so church, one of the things that we have to remember is that we have to pursue peace with perseverance by not giving in to our appetites. Now we know he's not just talking about food. He's not primarily talking about food. He's talking about the stupid decisions that we often make because of our fleshly desires. And that's where we'll close this morning. The idea that, that Paul presents this picture for us. And in Galatians chapter 5, he reminds us that we have two things at work within us. We have the leadership of the Holy Spirit, but we also have the desires of the sinful flesh. And he tells us that those two things are working against one another. They are battling for one another. But then he goes on to tell us, down in verse 24, that those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We have to be in the business of crucifixion. Now Jesus has already been crucified. We don't have to do that again. Jesus has already done the work once for all that, that, that purchases our salvation if we will respond by faith. But the business of crucifixion that we have to be in is that every single day we have to crucify our sinful desires. And let me tell you, you crucify them one day and they pop back up the next. It's not once for all. You just got to keep on battling. Parents, 
That's one of the biggest jobs that you have as a parent is to help partner with your children that they might learn how to say no to themselves. Right now, they're living in your home, and so they have your help to say no to themselves, but the day will come very soon where you're not looking over their shoulder. And if you haven't partnered with the leadership of the Holy Spirit to teach them what it looks like and feels like to be aware of that sinful desire but not give in to it, you are setting them up for disaster. If you let them always do what they want to do, you are setting them up for disaster. Because we have to learn how to not give in to our appetites. Now, church, I am abundantly thankful that I don't do that by myself. I'm abundantly thankful that I have the help of God's people. That's why I joined a church many years ago, because I need the help of God's people. That's why I believe God called me to lead a church, because God's people need the help of God's people. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I'm also grateful and more grateful for the leadership of the Holy Spirit. I'm grateful that I, that, I, that I not only don't have to do it in my own strength, but that I can't do it in my own strength. And so we have to learn as God's people to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we have to formulate our own path to a certain degree, but we have to learn to follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. That is the only way that we can keep moving forward in the face of adversity. And let me just remind you, you know this, I don't have to remind you of this, but I'll say it anyway. The race is hard, but the rewards are worth it. The race that is set before us is hard. That's why the pastor said, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. If it was an easy race, we wouldn't have to have endurance. But it's a hard race. But rest assured, take God at his word that the rewards are worth it. And he's leading us by the blood of his son Jesus and the power of his Holy Spirit that we might keep moving forward in the face of adversity. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the truth of your word. Thank you for the practical instruction. Lord, as I said earlier, we can hear all the practical instruction in the world. But if we don't do it, it won't help us. Father, I pray that you would help us to be doers of the word and not hearers only. Lord, help us to dole out your grace with our works and with our words. Help us to, to weed out the bitterness that so easily flourishes in the human heart and help us not to give in to the appetites of the flesh. Father, I'm grateful for forgiveness. We are thankful for the merciful hand of a heavenly Father who loves us. And Father, we're thankful for the power of the Holy Spirit who leads us. Father, I pray in this moment that we would allow the Holy Spirit to rain down upon us. Lord, that we would recognize that it's it, it is more than, a, than an impersonal force that, that you have placed your spirit within us to direct us and empower us that we might keep moving forward in the face of adversity. Father, I pray that whatever it is that you want us to do in response to your word, that we would respond in obedience. Lord, whether it means placing our faith in your son Jesus for the first time or weeding out a particular evidence of bitterness in our heart or confessing the damage that our words can do, 
Uh, Father, we pray that, that you would have your way in us in this moment and that we would respond in obedience. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as always, our altars will be open. If you need to come forward and just spend some time with the Lord, you can come and you can pray. You can pray by yourself. There are others here. If you would like to pray with somebody, they'll, they'll be up at the front. They'll be out in the lobby afterwards. But however the Lord is leading you to respond, respond in obedience. Stand with us as we sing together. I'll be here to receive you, to rejoice with you, to offer gospel-centered, godly counsel to you, and to celebrate with you for responding in obedience. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, oh, comforter. I was a little bit unsure of using that song that said rain down in the midst of the weather we've been having. <laughs> but we could certainly stand for more of the Holy Spirit to rain down in our lives. Uh, have a seat for just a moment as we present this, this one who has come. Holly, if you will come and stand by me. This is Holly Hamilton, and uh, Holly has been worshiping with us for a month or two. Uh, she feels like this is the place that, that God has led her to. Uh, that, that she might continue her walk with the Lord and her service of Him. 
I had a chance to sit down with her this week and, and hear a little bit more about her testimony and how she has responded in faith to what Christ has done for her. I've uh, been baptized as a believer and has been walking with the Lord, and, and she feels that this is the place that God would have her to continue that walk. And I know that many of you have, have already had a chance to get to know her, but we want to affirm her in that decision. So if you would rejoice uh, that she wants to be officially a part of our church family, would you let her know that by saying, Praise the Lord. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of a procedural change today. Normally we have our new members kind of just stay right here up front. We're going to take advantage of our new main lobby and the space that it has. Uh, so as the deacon of the week is praying, uh, I'll take Holly out into our main lobby. She'll be right in front of the welcome table, right in the front there. And I know you'll want to come by and, uh, and, and just get to know her, meet her, and welcome her into our church family. Uh, ben Archer is going to come now and and lead us in a word of prayer as our deacon of the week. Let me remind you, if you have just a moment, uh, especially you men, and you can stay for just a few minutes and help us set up the room for tonight. Yeah, as we're stacking chairs, let's try to stack those up carefully and make sure they're lining up right so we don't damage those chairs. But if you could help us for a few moments as we set the room up, that would be great. Remember, four is no more. So come at 5 o'clock tonight. Join us at 5 o'clock as we continue. You don't have to have been at a table already. we got a spot for you. We will be glad to put you there. Um, and then as you're leaving, one final announcement is that we have our new directories in. Uh, everyone who has a picture in that directory or those of you who have joined the church since October, you have a copy waiting for you for free. It'll be on your left, just past the cafe as you're leaving today. For everybody else, you can purchase a directory for as little as $5. Uh, those are great tools as we huddle up together and build relationships and go deep in those relationships. So stop by at the table uh, right after the service and get your directory. All right. Turn this thing on. There we go. Now let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. Thank you that we can gather together and, and worship you. Uh, we pray that in this following week we'd be intentional in, in what we do. We'd be pursuers of peace and uh, pursuers of holiness and uh, that we'd share the grace that you've given us um, to others around us. That you'd give safety uh, today and uh, that uh, you'd bring us back together so that we could uh, worship you more and encourage each other. In Jesus' name, amen. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. Longing just to bring something that's of worth, that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song. For a song in itself is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my heart I'm coming back to the heart of It's all about you, Jesus I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it When it's all about you It's all about you, Jesus King of endless Every single breath I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself 
is not what you have required You search much deeper within Through the way things appear You're looking into my Looking into my heart Looking into my heart 